Welcome to another episode of Chats Chat. Join Chad Chilius and me, Dax Castro, where each week we wax poetic about document accessibility topics, tips, and the struggle of remediation and compliance. So sit back, grab your favorite mug of whatever, and let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Today's podcast is sponsored by Creative Pro Week. The Creative Pro Week conference is in Phoenix, Arizona this year and is on June 5th through the 9th. And it's an amazing conference for design professionals. And this year also includes some accessibility sessions that Dax and I will be presenting. And if you use the code CPNCAD, you'll get $100 off any multi-day pass. So head on over to creativeproweek.com for more information. My name is Chad Chilius. I'm an Adobe Certified Instructor, as well as Director of Training Solutions and Principal at Chax Training and Consulting. And my name is Dax Castro. I am Director of Media Productions here at Chax Training Consulting. And Chad and I are both certified as Accessible Document Specialists. And if you'd like your Accessible Document Specialist certification, head on over to Accessibility Association dot org slash certifications and learn more about how you can get your certification it's a really great way to show um that you know what you know and that you are you know that you've got the chops to do it uh i've we're finding that a lot more employers are starting to list ads as part of the requirements for jobs that are related to uh accessibility remediation and that so Definitely, definitely worthwhile. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but more and more of the the job postings that I'm seeing are including like ADS and uh, sometimes they'll list CPAC, but uh, those are typically not Mm -hmm. document specific. Anyway, so today's topic, I figured we'd talk a bit about some of the most common things that first time remediators are encountering, right? What are those errors that everybody we see over and over again on the message board? Almost always the message thread starts with I'm new to accessibility, but I can't figure out why dot, dot, dot. Right. Yep. Yep. And, and, you know, you you have to be careful because people's first approach is to Google it. Yep. Right. You know, they'll go Mm -hmm. to their search engine. They'll they'll do a search on it. You know, how do I X, Y, Z? And unfortunately, as we've talked about before, Dax, there's a lot of misinformation out there. You know, you, you, you really got to be careful what you, what rabbit hole you go down because, uh, you you know, we've gotten messages from people and, and they're like, well, I exported a PDF from InDesign and then I run auto tag on the file. Right. And, you know, you and I are like, Poof, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, you know, and, and it's just because that, you know, they, they were reading an article and somebody said, yeah, run auto tag and, and that'll, that'll take care of your problem. Obviously that's, that's not the case. So, um, you know, to your point, Dax, um, you, you know, we do get a lot of posts on the forum. We get a lot of emails, LinkedIn messages where people are like, Hey, I'm just getting started. And, X, Y, Z. Right. Yeah. So, well, you so know, what, one of the ones that I see a lot of people, um, uh, uh, say is, you know, they come up with, well, accessible font size, right? What is the, what is the, the, the size of access uh, for accessibility? And, and almost always I hear 12 point type single spaced. And I'm like, where are they getting this information from? In fact, most of the time it comes from the national federation for the blind, uh, they have uh, their guidelines and preferences when sending uh, communications to their constituents um, for people with low vision, they recommend 12 point type, but there's no such thing as an accessible accessibility requirement for font size. Now, as an organization, your organization may choose, you know, ours as the, the organizations that I belong to in the past have said 11 point is the smallest and then nine point for footnotes. But some people say eight point for footnotes and, um, you know, but but there really is no requirement, right, in, in WCAG or uh, <laughs> the other way people say it, there's no ADA requirement for font size, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, you know, it, and again, you know, it's, it's a, it's a term people have grown to use, right? You know, I mean, even my clients use that. They're, they're like, okay, this is ready for ADA. I mean, there, there's nothing in ADA about 
digital document accessibility, right? right? You know what I mean? That it doesn't exist. But but kind of getting back to what you said, like it is a bit surprising, isn't it, that there is no guidance on minimum font size for a document, right? Sure. I mean, it, mm-hmm. I think it kind of would make sense. Although it, I I think the reason why WCAG does not include it is is because it's just so so wide open, right? Oh. I mean, there's really no, you know, like, okay, if you use 12 point, but yeah, use 12 point, but use times Roman, right. <laughs> not probably not the best approach. Right. So, um, so I, I do think it is a good idea to have a, a intercompany standard, right? I think it's a good idea to say, Hey, we, we, we believe that, you know, 11 point minimum is what you should be using, uh, for, for your products. But, um, you know, that is going to be helping the group of people who are, who are low vision, right? right. I mean, that, that's who that is assisting because somebody using a screen reader, it could be one point type and it's going to read the same as 12 point type. Well, right? because so, it's voiced, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so the, the benefit of having a requirement for minimum font size is really going to be benefiting low vision users. And, um, you know, I, I do think it's, it's a good idea to, you know, uh, I, I used to get a magazine It's actually a surfing magazine Mm -hmm. and I, I swear everything was set in nine point type. Yeah. Right. And, and I mean, I'm just a, you know, I'm a sighted user, but I do now wear glasses and I could not read that without the assistance of my glasses. Like I literally could not read any, any of that that content. It was just so, so tiny. So now again, that their market was a very young group of people, right? They're, they're, they're surfers in their early twenties who <laughs> have, have 20, 20 vision, no problem. True. Right. But, but, a a 40 something year old person like me, you know, I, I, I opened it up and I'm like, Oh my gosh. So anyway, uh, so again, yeah, that, that's a really common, uh, re- really common thing. People ask is what is the minimum font size. And as you pointed out, Dax, there, there really is no, you know, specific font size that's required for accessibility. Right. The only requirement for, for readability is that images of text be readable at 200%. Meaning if you zoom in, if your PNG is a scan of, you know, if you've got a scan of a, of a, of a textbook and at 200%, you zoom in and can't read it, then that would be a violation of WCAG. Right. So. Right. Right. Well, the, the next one, Chad, that we see all the time is I'm editing my 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 PDF, making it accessible, and all of a sudden my content disappeared, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. That That's a, a really common one. And that typically occurs when you go into your content pane and start manipulating items in the content pane, right? And the... We typically do that, right? So, so the typical reason why you do that is to fix your reading order, right? Right, and and I think we're going to get to that a little bit later. But um, the 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 problem with that is that, that yes, you can fix the reading order. The problem, however, is that the content pane is also the stacking order of content visually in the document. Right. It's basically and, your layers, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Bring to front, send to back. You could view it as your layers. You could view it as your stacking order. Uh, but, but, but essentially what often happens is you'll say, Oh, I want this to be read first and you move it and then it just disappears. Right. Really what happens is there's typically a, a shape behind that text, usually like a filled, you know, a filled color or something like that. And as you adjust the, the, the movement of the item in the content pane, it sends it behind that shape. Gotcha. So you, you have to be aware of it is all. And, and listen, I've had people start over from scratch when that happens. Oh yeah. And yeah. And, and the reality is it's not the end of the world. All you got to do is find that shape and then send it behind the text. Yep. Right. I usually just can fix it. And in the content panel, it's confusing even more because the top of the list, the very first item in that list is the back 
and the bottom is the front. So typically what I do is if I've got a sidebar that disappeared, I'll go hunt for that background color that's on the sidebar, and then I'll move that item to the top of the list in my content panel. Now, as long yeah. as it doesn't overlap another shape, It'll mm -hmm. always just put it in the back. I don't care where it goes. I just want it farther back than my text is in that stacking order. So absolutely. And well, and the, and the good thing about that is that that shape is not counted as an item in the reading order. Right. Right. It, it's like, what do I want to say? Agnostic or I don't know what the right term would be, but it, it's just, it's just there. It's not included in the reading order because it's not tagged right and therefore you could do whatever you want with it um I, I will tell you like as you gain experience when you see an item like that i know like what i do is as i'm selecting items i'm like oh there's a shape there yep and i'll make sure i click on the shape as well when i move it that yeah, way it all sure. moves it you know in in conjunction with one another it just it it makes it a little bit easier, right? Sure. It's one less thing that you have to deal with later on. As we say, it's more semantic, you know, and actually that's a good point to bring up for people who are new to remediation. There's this word we throw around all the time, semantic, semantic markup, semantic layout. It's the, the tag, the tag is a semantic tag. Semantic is really just a fancy way of saying that it's correct that it's program, you know, from a programming standpoint, it is programmatically correct, right? Yeah, or, or that it's, I mean, I think this falls under uh, info and relationship stacks, right? You know, like semantic markup is effectively info and relationships. You know, it's it's basically tagged as what as what it is, right? Um, and, and it's structured as what it is, right? right. So- Right. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, usually the terms that it says programmatically determined, right, is kind of the thing you see in a lot of the WCAG principles. And that just means I can look at the code and know that that code is appropriately the right code for what's being displayed on the page. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. So we talked a little bit about reading order, Chad, right? The the reading order is another one we see is the reading order messed up my tags tree. I'm setting the reading order and I spent all this time working on my tags and I move something in the reading order and now my tags are all messed up. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. And, and so it, and it, boy, we're, 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 we just went down a rabbit hole, didn't we? Right? So like, like a lot of people, will focus on the reading order first because right. logically it makes sense. Like when you see a panel that says reading order yep, and you're like, Oh, that's the order that I need to make sure is correct. And, right. and they're not wrong per se. However, as we, as you and I, as we all know, JAWS and NVDA actually use the tag order and not the reading order. Right. Right. But and there again, is I'm not saying, yeah, I'm not saying the reading order is not important, just saying that that they go to the reading order first, thinking that that's the be all end all. Right? Well, and, and the confusion is, is that the, the evolution of what it means to be an accessible PDF has happened over time. And in sure. the beginning, it, the only order was the read order. That's all there was. There weren't tags. And so um, older programs still use the reading order. In fact, Acrobat, we talked about this on one of our last podcast episodes, Acrobat's reflow still uses the reading order even within its own program, right? Yeah, and, yep. And so then the tag order came about but there was still reason to keep the reading order around because of these other programs. So in essence, we kind of have to have both of these right now. And maybe in the future sometime they'll, they'll do away with the reading order and it have it just yeah. be automatically assigned based on the tag order, which uh, Adobe, please <laughs> someday do that. <laughs> um, but you know, but, it, but it is that tag order, as you say. Well, and, and with the reading order, there are no semantics, right? right? I mean, it's just the order, yep. right? You don't know that it's a heading one or a heading two or a fit, you know, it's just in the right order. 
Right. Um, now, now what gets really confusing for, especially for beginners is, you know, you open up Adobe Acrobat and within the Adobe Acrobat interface, there's a, a navigation pane called reading order. Right. And people see that and they're like, oh, that's where I must need to go to set the reading order. Yep. And it definitely makes sense. I mean, I, I, I don't fault anybody for, for trying to do this, but um, Guys, you know, if you're listening, don't do anything in the reading order pane. Like yeah. it's it's pretty much useless, right? I mean, aside from being able to view the order of objects, which you can also do by opening up the reading order tool, um, it, it really has no benefit and it actually can totally hose your document. Right. Well, you could you would say it's got some side effects, right? The reading order panel does did have a purpose, but if you use it and you've already tagged your document and it's all tagged in the right order and you start moving things around in the read order, Leonard Rosenthal, what it's been two years now since he's been on our podcast. Can you believe that, Chad? Two years. Yeah. Um, two years ago, he said, look, it's a feature. We did this on purpose to try to help you out. And I'm just like, don't do me any favors, please. Just don't. stop doing me favors. Yes. Right. Um, but yeah. um, so, but so, yeah, so go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, you're, you're, I think we're, we're both about to say the same thing. I mean, it's, if you, if you have fixed the tag order and the tags in your document, and you then go into the reading order pane and start adjusting the reading order it will totally screw up your tag structure. Yeah. I mean, hundred percent. And, uh, you know, Dax, I, I think, I think you and I can admit that we learned this the hard way. Oh yeah. Right. You know I mean? Even you and I, you know, back in the day, you know, we're like, okay, we got our tag order. Let's now fix the reading order. And you fix the reading order. You go back to the tag order and it's, and it's a, a you have a bunch of mess. holes and a bunch of empty oh, tags. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, it's horrible. So that, and that's where, you know, we discovered that you can use the content pane to fix your reading order without affecting the tag order that you've already set. Well, so, and if you need to have those numbers, if you want to have those numbers vis oh, yeah. visible, you mentioned earlier, just open the read order tool and just leave it open. And as long yeah. as it's open, then you'll be able to see the numbers and be in the content pane. The only difference is in the content pane, it doesn't show you the number to the left of the object um, in, the, in, in the list of objects. You just have to that'd look on be, the page visually. That'd be really helpful, yeah. right? Like if it actually showed you the number in the content pane, because then you could just you know, move things around. But yeah, that's what I typically do is I'll open up the reading order tool and then I'll start adjusting in the content pane. And then you get a live update yep. as you make a change, your numbers update and you're like, okay, that now looks good. And you can kind of keep going through and, and, and making adjustments. I think if they, maybe one of the reasons why they don't have the numbers is because then they would have to admit that the, the content panel reads from the bottom up and they'd be like, <laughs> why does it read that way? Uh... <laughs> Yeah, don't pay attention to that. <laughs> I mean, every Adobe program known to man, the the layer order is always top to bottom. Right. But for whatever reason in Acrobat, I, I mean, I, I got to believe that programmatically they could change that. Like programmatically, you say, you know, just, just read it top to bottom like every other program in the free world. Um but uh, it, it is tricky, but you know, you, you get used to it. Um, but well, then they probably have to change InDesign. I was going to say InDesign. Right? I wasn't going to mention it because I was like, well, maybe he's not thinking about this, but InDesign's <laughs> the same way. InDesign's yeah. the exact same way. And if you think about it, PowerPoint is the same way too. The, con the, well, the selection pane is bottom up. Uh, the, yeah. the first item is at the bottom, only the new reading order pane, which is only available for certain versions of, uh, of PowerPoint. Um, does it actually show you the numbers reads top down? It's really nice panel the way they've got it set up. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So the, the other thing that let, moving on, right. So the next thing that we hear a lot is that I have, I'm getting these untagged annotations 
And I've mm. got a, and usually our first question is, do you have a link in your header or footer? Right, Chad? Yep. Yep. Yeah. A hundred percent. You know, so the, the error, right. Uh, untagged annotations is the result of you having a link in your document that is not attached to content. Yep. Right. So in order for a link to function properly, um, the, the, you have a link tag and then the textual content for the link is inside of that link tag. Yeah. And the, you, you can get this problem one of two ways. If you add a hyperlink in Acrobat by using the drag and drop a rectangle, uh -huh. that is going to give you an untagged annotation because it's not connected to anything. Right. It's just coordinates on the page. Exactly. And, and so, you know, if you're curious, the better approach is in Acrobat, uh, use your selection tool, the black arrow tool, select the text that you want to become the link and then right click on that and choose create link. Yep. And that will take your selected text, put it inside of the link tag and, and, and everybody's happy. Um, the other thing that causes that problem is it's a common thing that happens inside of Adobe InDesign because people will put text on a master page and then make that text a hyperlink. And yep. people do it in Word too. They'll put it in the header footer right. and, and you'll get the same thing. The, the parent page in InDesign is interesting. I see a lot of people do the, they, they want a um, return to TOC or return to index, or they'll have, a, they put an entire menu up inside the, um, the header because they're trying to make uh, Acrobat work more like a web page than a PDF. Right, right. And, and so, you know, the fundamental problem in InDesign or in Word, as you described, Dax, is that when you put something on a parent page or in Word, you put something in the header footer area, those elements are automatically artifacted. Yep. But the hyperlink is a different element that does not get artifacted. Right. It still outputs as a link. Yep. And as we described earlier, it, it's a link that's not attached to anything. Um, and, and so putting it on a master page creates this conundrum, if you will, where it says, okay, the content gets artifacted, but you still have a link here that I have to output. And when I do, that link is not attached to anything. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, the, you know, you know, one of two solutions to the problem don't hyperlink content that's on the parent page or, or in the header footer in word, or at least in the case of InDesign, you have to override that object on every document page so that the content is tagged and the hyperlink can be attached to it. Right. And there's a couple of scripts. Keith Gilbert has a script. There's a couple of free scripts out there inside InDesign. You can actually, if all you have, if you want to override everything that's on the header footer, you can use override all master, all, all parent page items and, and that solves it as well. But you have to do that. You have to remember to do that as a last step, right? Save out a copy Absolutely. and all of that. So it's, it can be something that gets overlooked. Yep. Um, the, the other thing that we, you know, that we find a lot of people will say is, you know, I spent all this time in InDesign putting all of these alt text descriptions on my hyperlinks. And when I go out to Acrobat, I don't hear those. I don't see them. They're not there. What happened? Right. right? Yep. Well, and we yeah. talk, we, we, we talk about this, uh, uh, you know, we've talked about this a couple of different times. We have, but, it, but at one point it was set as the alt text and then the PDF association, PDF UA community said, no, no, that's not programmatically semantic. It should be in the content key. And the content key is really this metadata field that is supposed to hold the purpose for the link. 
The unfortunate part is JAWS and NVDA don't recognize the content key as a va as a voiced metadata field. So when they when the, the the screen reader gets to that URL, it just reads a URL, and you're like, well, why did I spend all this time putting all these yeah. descriptions in? And the answer is to pass the checker. That's yeah. again, one of those things that's just, it's very frustrating, right? It's super frustrating because, you know, as you and I always talk about, um, you know, we always try to err on the side of the user, yep. right? We want the user experience to be a, a, the, the best that it can be. And, um, you know, the, 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 the people who are, you know, very connected to the standards um, they, they said, oh no, the, the, <laughs> I know this sounds weird to say it out loud, but they said, oh no, the alt text for the hyperlink shouldn't be in the alt text field. Right. And, and like, and when they said that, we're like, okay. Right. And then they said, it's supposed to be in the content entry. Well, you and I, I remember that day we went into the PDF UA specifications and we, we, we like dug deep and we were like, Sure enough, that's yep. where they want it to be. And then you and I had preached it for a while. And then one day somebody's like, hey, I've added all of those as content entry. But when I test it with my screen reader and kudos for testing with your screen reader, they said it's not being voiced. And right. we're like, that's crazy. <laughs> Let me test that. Right. I remember right. the day, right. Yeah. We're like, that's crazy. That can't be true. And we tested it and you and I looked at each other and we're like, Oh my God, it's not being voiced. You nope. know? <laughs> and, well, and, and that goes, it, that goes back to something that happens quite a bit is that we change the way we do something without testing the end user experience. And you mentioned earlier, yeah. you and I are very much user advocates. I, I, I've said this time and time again, the standards help me get there, but my goal is a good user experience. Yeah. And I, I, that is all I'm concerned about. And, and unfortunately, you know, I mean, fortunately now we very much teach the idea of we, you know, testing with a screen reader and making sure you understand what that user experience is, is going to be and asking the question, what do I want that user experience to be as you develop your documents? Um, but there was a time where that wasn't really the first things out of our mouth. So, yeah. you know, it, 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 you know, we all grow and change, right? We do. And, and, and I mean, following the standards, I mean, let's be honest, following the standards is easy. Right. I mean, because right. it's very black and white. Um, and, and, and again, I, I don't want to make it sound like there's a lot of these things, right? I mean, it's, it, you know, typically the standard does a good job, but, but there are situations, Dax, where I know you and I absolutely violate the standard to get the better user experience. Sure. You know, um, what what gets tricky for all of us is, I mean, we, we all want to hand that that report to the client with all green check marks saying that this document is is compliant. But it gets really hard when you're like, I know this isn't going to be read correctly, but I need it to pass the checker so that the client feels comfortable that that I've done my job. Yeah. So it, it's a uh, a sticky wicket. Well, you know, it goes back to <laughs> our content key entry. Uh, the in in Acrobat, there is a pre-flight fix up where you can go in and it says set all of the content key entries for all of the link annotations. And all it does is take whatever is the URL, whatever's on page as the hyperlink and populate it into the content key entry. In essence, it passes a checker it satisfies the requirement, but it doesn't really give the user any better user experience because first of all, it's not voiced. But second of all, even if it was voiced, it's just a regurgitation of whatever that long URL is, right? Yeah. Now, I I've been in documents where there have been over a hundred links and I promise you I'm not going through to every one of them and making sure I set it alt text for them. So to be fair, that's really not, not a typical user experience. But when the link cannot be determined based on content in the sentence or link 
uh, hints within the actual description, you know, download our earnings report is the link, right? If those two things cannot be determined, then really you should be setting alt text for your hyperlinks. It's just something that I think a lot of people, you know, when we do accessibility at the end and you've got 150 of those, it's a lot easier to run the fix up and get past the checker. Well, and, you know, a lot of times, you know, I know um, I've worked with a lot of documents where they will have what I call implicit hyperlinks, right? Where it's, it's like the hyperlink is spelled out. Right. And, 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 and it's often like, you know, two lines. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's like, you know, www.example.com slash X two, five, nine, seven, three, two, four, you know, whatever. And they, it's interesting because they do that because they also print the document. Sure. Right. And, and yeah. so for somebody who's reading this, on paper and they want to be able to get to that hyperlink if they want to they could type in that link hopefully you don't make a mistake and and get to that url now now you and i have said multiple times like you know bitly is a great alternative to that because it shortens it considerably right i have encountered clients who don't allow bitly links yeah because they don't want it to be obfuscated. They want the URL to be visible, the entire words, all of it. And I will say, if you give me a URL that's, you know, 150 characters, I'm just Googling it. I'm just right. going to Google a couple of words from it and, <laughs> and get the link that way. I am not typing in all that text. So, you know, I get it from a process standpoint and from a legalistic standpoint, but the reality is no one's typing though that you know, 150 character URL. That's, that's just not, not. Yeah. It, it's not perfect and there's not a perfect solution, but yeah. um, we, we do have recommendations and um, I think it provides a, a better experience for both cited and non-cited users because they don't have to type 150 character hyperlink to, to get to the document, you know? Yeah. Um, well, so. you know, I know this was supposed to be a top five, you know, things that that first time remediators kind of encounter. But I got a bonus one I think we should close our our podcast with here. And that's irregular table errors, because I think mm. this is the one that frustrates most people because there's so many different ways that this can manifest itself. Right. For sure. For sure. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I'm going to pick on word. <laughs> sure. You know, only because I, I think that's that's typically where a lot of these violations stem from. And well, word... I'm going to pick on I'm going to pick on InDesign after you're done. So we'll OK, we'll, we'll, we'll be good. Um, So Word is happy to allow you to merge cells in a table. Right. Um, word will happily do that. You can merge um, rows horizontally. You can also merge them vertically. Um. The problem is that Word itself, Word as a program itself, doesn't understand what you just did from an accessibility standpoint, right? Well, so like the minute, go, go ahead. The, when, and to be more clear about that, if I'm a, a person using assistive technology inside a live Word document, the assistive technology doesn't, is not able to voice programmatically, right? Semantically the relationship of cells when it comes to merged cells. And that's why we get the, the, um, the, the partial falsehood of no merged cells inside word. In fact, word right. itself, the checker tells you that as an error, right? The, the reality is that you can export that to PDF and fix it and make it be correct. But as a live word doc, those merged cells don't, don't get voiced correctly. Right. Right. And, and then also making a PDF from that word document also does not output correctly. Right. So it's kind of a, a, a double whammy. Like not only is the word document not accessible, but the PDF generated from that word document is also broken because those merged cells are not properly defined. Well, and, and I've actually encountered an issue where depending upon what order I merged certain columns or rows. The table structurally was created differently. 
that things mm-hmm. became part of either the row above it or the row below it based on wh- what order I merged those things. And, and, you know, sometimes we change the way tables look and we're like, oh, let's go this way instead. And so you unmerge things and merge things again. And I find that that can really mess up how Word interprets that table. Yeah. 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 The, the other one, obviously, well, not obviously, most people don't know, is that there is this property called scope inside a table. And it's for heading cells, that first row or first column, or maybe multiple first rows or multiple first columns, um, uh, has to have instructions to say, I am a column header or I am a row header. And as a column header, I'm responsible. I'm describing the things below in my column, or I'm a row header. I'm describing things to the right of me in my row for whatever unfathomable reason. InDesign does not have the ability to set a row header. And I just can never get my head around why this is a thing. How can you not do something so basic? So what that requires is, well, Chad, let's talk about what what does it require? Well, um, you know, so if if you're only using InDesign natively, um, after you make the PDF file, you need to go into those tables in Acrobat or your third-party tool of choice and say, these are row headers for this table, right? So you use, you make it a header and you set it, set the scope to be a row header. Um, And I mean, while we're talking about that, even though InDesign can define column headers, it fails to set the scope on them. Right. So, so even if you do do it, even after making the PDF, you still have to go in to, to those column headers and tell the scope to be a, a, a column. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's definitely a challenge. Now, you know, how do we get around that? Again, I, I've I've mentioned this plugin on our podcast before. The the made to tag plugin does a phenomenal job of actually allowing you to define column and row headers in a table. Right. Um, and, and it even goes to the extent where you can do complex tables you know where they'll like merge the entire row into one right and and that's supposed to become a header you can you can actually make that compliant using made to tag as well unless um, unless your table splits across a page right um you you could still do it um in 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 my defense I think you do have to do a little bit of extra work to make it happen, but it can work across a page. Yeah. Well, for sure it can, but made to tag, I think that's one of the only real limit. There's a couple of limitations, but that's probably one of the only ones is that it, it, it doesn't do well when they were talking about tables that split across pages. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I like to be balanced and fair, right? When we're talking about these plugins and and programs and everything, I want to make sure people understand because here's the thing. I know as an end user, if I'm struggling with a certain thing and I'm like, oh, this program's going to fix it. I just did this, Chad, literally just did this. You know, we edit this podcast and and um, I'm always looking for ways to do it faster because it's, you know, it can take a couple of hours to to edit the podcast. And I I, I just watched this TikTok and this guy says, look, this program will, will, will edit your podcast in one minute, one click. And I go in, I spend the time to download it. I get it all set up and I do it. And it's like, yeah, it didn't work right. And I emailed the company and they're like, yeah, it doesn't work when you have a captions track in your premiere file. And I'm like, I went through all of that just to figure (laughs) out that it doesn't work when I put captions in. And of course, (laughs) premiere has a bug where once you put captions on a, on a video, you can't take them out. There is no way to remove captions on a file once you've put them in. If you set the transcript and then you set the captions, you can delete those those tracks as much as you want, but you can't actually remove them. So I had to start over again. Wow. And, and I'm just like, wow, I wish I would have known. So it's that type of thing that I try to make yeah. sure that I, I make sure people understand that there are limitations to everything. Everything has its purpose. We get the question, Chad, and maybe you can speak to this, of, of, of and, and actually this is a good bonus 
thing that we get, right? The, the question is, what program should I use when I'm remediating right. my documents? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, you know, I, I never answer that question carte blanche because I always try to get more information from the user yep. because it, it really depends. Right. Um, you know, and, and, and I'll often say like, like, listen, I mean, it, it, do, do people give you PDFs untagged and say, make these compliant. Right. And if the answer is yes, I'm definitely going to direct them towards common look. Because yep. that's something that Common Look does very well. Yeah. Um, if they tell me, oh, no, they're almost always tagged. They're just always wrong. Right. Then I might direct them towards Access PDF. Sure. Right? Uh, I mean, Common Look could do that, too. But you also start then having to evaluate the price of the product. Right. Well, and and, 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 the and other that's thing a, an important sure. factor. Well, and the other thing too is, is that if, if you tell me that you have a lot of merged documents, you're pull, you're constantly pulling documents together, this document and that document and making them together, but you're getting these errors, then I'm absolutely going to re recommend access PDF because that's usually you're going to get structural parent tree errors or font encoding errors or missing spaces, all sorts of things that are kind of idiosyncrasy with uh, merging multiple files together, right? Or if you've got a, a document, you deal a lot with complex tables, Access PDF is going to be a, 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 have a lot more solutions directed at your problems. Yeah, yeah. So like I said, I, I, I like you and I try to be very unbiased, right? I right. mean, we, uh, I, I like, I like a lot of products, yep. right? And, and, and I'm, uh, you know, again, like, you know, um, I want to recommend the best product for a user's situation. Yeah. And so like I said, very seldom do I just say, Oh, just get this, you know, right. I, I like to get more information, you know, and I like to hear them tell me what their workflow is like, what their, you know, and, and if they tell me every one of their files starts in InDesign, then I'm recommending made to tag absolutely because that is a, you know, that, that is a, a game changer, you know, and, or if it, every it one of, of their files are, are made in word, I'm absolutely going to recommend access word because as a group, large government organizations, you know, when, when you all, when you're getting a hundred PDFs from people, all of them making them on their own, all from their own computers, all inside word, there is nothing better than just telling them, look, instead of hitting save as PDF, use save as access PDF, access word yeah. PDF, right? And yeah. that's going to give you a mostly or all, all, all the way compliant file without them really having to know much of anything. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it goes back to uh, one, one of our podcast guests was Jeremy Seta yep. from the North Idaho College. And he talked about uh, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu if you can improve your position by 1%, yep. you're now doing better, right? right? And and that's really what these third-party tools do for us, right? I mean, yeah. sure, natively, we can get to here. But with a third-party product, if I can get to here, that's that, that, that's that much less work I need to do when I'm making my, my document compliant. And And for a lot of us, it really is all about saving time and saving energy. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope that everybody got some really great, uh, you know, information on this, this episode of our podcast. Uh, you know, these are the top, what did we get to six or seven? Uh, yeah. <laughs> we started with five.